So I forgot one thing. Okay, and I just want to make sure I mention this so that we know what to look for when we go over all the different files. Okay, so when we talk about a file, we want to know distinguishing characteristics and features, but I want to expand on that. I mean, I'm talking about like body parts also. Okay, body parts. Okay, so yes, definitely look at the distinguishing characteristic like segments or the fact that an analyta means segmented worm, but also look at body parts too. Okay, so body parts become more important such as ostia and osteo. Do you guys remember those body parts? Who has those body parts? A sponge, right? It's those little holes or the big hole on top, right? So make sure you guys are paying attention to the body parts in addition to feeding style, larval type, and then the different classes within the phyla and attributes of each class. Okay, so it's time to make sure we get that one down. Body parts. Okay. All right, you guys have a good weekend? Okay, I had a good weekend. Um, I'll tell you guys what I did later um, because I couldn't get the picture to come on my computer. But I'll get it during the break, but first I do want to show you something. I went diving and I found these. Do you guys know what these are? Yeah, these are shark egg cases, okay? A horn shark egg case. I don't know, they're pretty cool, right? You guys want them? Nobody want these. All right, I'll give you one. Um, all right, who wants the second one? All right, we'll see who gets a higher grade on the quiz. <laughs> okay. So anyways, uh, shark egg cases. We'll talk more about those when we talk about chordata and um, sharks in general, right? And why these eggs are superior to like a land egg. And I, what I'm saying is like land eggs are good for land and ocean eggs are good for the ocean, but not the other way around, right? Okay, you guys can pass this around and take a look at it though. It's pretty cool, you know, I think it's cool. It's empty, so don't worry, there's no baby shark inside. Okay. Okay, so let's get into this. Where are we? All right, you guys. We are moving on in our discussion of animals, okay? And hopefully we can cover one and a half of these lectures today. Um, Cnidarians and mollusks, okay? These are two new phyla that we're going to introduce today. We'll definitely get to talk about both of them. We're not going to get to finish this whole thing, but we will finish this one tomorrow. But before we actually get into this, let's see, do we know what some of these things are already? Like, I think that some of you guys had a Nidarian representative in that pilot assignment in the beginning. What is it? Uh, SC and Emony, good, yeah, what else? Oh yeah, you actually saw them at the beach, right? Yeah. Jellyfish, okay, good. Yeah, so it looks like we already know what a Nidarian is, and we don't have to talk about this. Right, I was joking. Okay, a mollusk. You guys know what a mollusk is? Clam. Like a clam. Good, yeah. Usually when I think of mollusk, I think of snail or clam, yeah, something like that, right? But, um, yeah, we'll get into this. We'll talk about all the different examples, the attributes, everything behind this board. Make sure you guys are paying attention to all those things when you go over there, okay? So we'll start off with cnidarians, right? It's spelled with a C, but don't pronounce the C. These are cnidarians, right? What do we see? Jellyfish. Right? Jellyfish. Um, if you want to be really pedantic, you can call them sea jellies because it's not a fish, but nobody calls it a sea jelly. Right? That word just doesn't roll off the tongue. Right? So jellyfish, right? These guys are ni uh, cnidarians because what do you guys know jellyfish do? Yeah, they sting you, right? Okay, and some of them could be really toxic, like lion's mane or... Portuguese man or some of them are not, right? Like moon jelly, that one's not that bad. But some of them could actually sting you, right? What do they use to sting you? Well, look at the name, Nidaria. They use nidocytes to sting you, okay? Nidocytes is a scientific word for stinging cells. Yeah, really? Hey, but I do know that blue sea turtles actually eat jellyfish almost as if they're immune to- They probably to their, are immune to To the sting it. or something like Yeah, they that. probably are, but if they're not, then I mean, they, they have scales, you know, and protects them from it. Um, there's a lot of things that eat poisonous things, right? Like, um, you know, whenever you do a drug, it's like poison, but people still do it, right? Like, mushrooms and stuff, right? But like, you know, small amounts probably won't kill them. You know, maybe they're immune to larger amounts than most organisms are, so it doesn't really matter too much. <clears throat> 
Okay, but yeah, good question. So stinging cells, right? These organisms are known for their stinging cells. Everybody here has stinging cells, okay? They may not be strong stinging cells, but they still have them, okay? They're strong enough for whatever they need to eat, okay? And usually jellyfish or sea anemones don't eat humans, so it's probably not gonna hurt you that much, right? But, you know, you could bet it would probably hurt a fish or something, right? Because that's what they're designed to eat. Okay, so cytosides, right? Let's take a look closely at how cytosides work. Okay, so I got this cool video to show you guys. Kind of does a little microscope in depth, right? It's pretty, pretty informative too, so let's pay attention to this. Hey, it's me, Destin, and welcome back to Smarter Every Day. If you've ever been stung by a jellyfish, you know that it's awful. Let me show you. So there's two ways that an animal can harm a human chemically, right? The first one is poison. We know what that is. Like if I were to eat this jellyfish and it was poisonous and I were to get sick, it's because it is a poisonous animal, right? Now venom is different. Venom is injected into your body. So it's kind of like these hypodermic needles. If you fill them up with venom and then you were to take that and inject that into your arm, that would be a venomous way of causing pain to your body, right? So wouldn't it be crazy if there was like hypodermic needles built into their tentacles and they could just stab you with them as soon as they rub up against you? Because that's exactly what happens. Jellyfish tentacles have organelles in them called nematocysts. They're like little hypodermic needles. And when you're swimming and those hypodermic needles brush up against your body, they stab into you and inject venom. It's insane. People have never seen these because they're so small you have to have a microscope and they're so fast that you have to use a high-speed camera. So now that we've rounded these two things up, where do we find our jellyfish? Check it out. I'm at James Cook University in Australia, in Cairns, and here's the deal. I've got the doctor here that's the world expert in animal venom. It's pretty cool. Let's go check it out. His name is Dr. Jamie Seymour. So we have a, uh, a high-speed camera here, and we're running an HD-SDI video out, and then Richard is recording it real What causes the nematocyst to fire? But what we do know is if we touch two leads from a 9-volt battery to the tentacle itself, we can get some of them to randomly fire, which allows us to record it with a phantom high-speed camera. Trigger! cell with some electrodes, right? And then it uh, shot off its little harpoon, and then you saw the venom coming out of the end, right? And then it said it took 11 milliseconds on average, right? Millisecond is a thousandth of a second, so I guess 11 milliseconds is like one one hundred, right? So pretty fast, I guess, and you know, depending on how long this nematocyst is, right, it will tell you whether it can penetrate your skin or not. Right? So sometimes, you know, if it's a really short nematocyst, they may not be able to penetrate your skin and you won't get envenomated, right? So it wouldn't matter too much. But yeah, it was pretty cool, right? I want you guys not to get too confused with these two words right here. Okay? They're almost used interchangeably sometimes, but the difference is this is the stinging cell, okay? Not this. This is the cell that stings, okay? Nidocyte, it's the actual cell. But you guys know that cells have organelles, right? Like a nucleus or the Golgi apparatus. Well, sometimes they have an organelle called a nematocyst. It's just the part of the cell that does the stinging, right? Okay, so like if you wanna put into a different perspective, like a, a boxer, for example, the part of the boxer that boxes is only his fists, but not his head, right? Okay, or his legs. He has other body parts but only part of it does the namesake. Does that make sense? The nidocyte, only part of it, the nematocyst itself does the sting, right? It's the sting part of it. Okay, cool. So anyways, the nematocyst, right? Inject the venom like a needle, as he explained, 
I, I like to call it a harpoon because they kind of get they're barbed and they get stuck in your skin, right? <clears throat> okay, so yeah, every cnidarian has cnidocytes, and the cnidocytes have nematocysts on them, and they can sting prey or you know whoever's trying to eat them or something like that, right? Okay, cool. So let's move on. Um, cnidarians, right? Can't see it from here, but if you guys look at from the top, at right, the very top, you look straight down the bell of the sea. This, this, I almost called it a sea jelly, a jellyfish. I'm not gonna stoop down that low, right? The, the bell of the jellyfish is circular, right? And it branches out in all directions. Remember that radial symmetry. So we're going back in terms of evolution, right? Bilateral symmetry came after radial symmetry, but I just wanted to get worms out of the way before we talk about this. So now here we are stepping a little bit back, talking about jellyfish and the other Nigerians because they have radial symmetry, okay? Just to remind you guys, radial symmetry is, you branch out in all directions, it's in general circular, and you can cut it any which way, and you'll always end up with two halves, right? So this is not a jellyfish or a Nidarian, but it is an example of radial symmetry. Do you guys see that, right? Branch out in all directions, you can cut it any way, and it'll always end up with two halves, right? Do you guys, anybody know what this actually is? What is this? Wait, is that some kind of coral? Um, that's a good guess because it is made of calcium carbonate, but uh, no, it's actually a serogen, right? It's a serogen test. Um, we'll talk more about serogens when we cover echinoderms, but this is a good example of radial symmetry, right? Can you guys think of some other examples of radial symmetry? Maybe, maybe it doesn't have to be an animal. Maybe something that you're familiar with. Pizza. Pizza? Yeah, that's a good one. Only if they spread the toppings evenly. Because you know, one side might have more meat than the other. That would, that would be not really symmetric, right? But yeah, good. Okay, so cheese pizza, right? What else? Nothing else. That's the only radially symmetric thing you guys can think of. Okay. Okay. Yeah. How about something that's not food? Frisbee. What was that? Frisbee. Yeah, sure. If it doesn't have a design on it, right? Or if the design is symmetrical, right? Okay. Anything else? What was that? A bike wheel. A bike wheel, yeah, a tire, yeah. Sure. Spokes on a tire. That's a good example of radial symmetry. So I have a few examples just so we have a visual representation of a snowflake, right? Radially symmetric, like an orange, right? And almost every flower is radially symmetric as well. Okay? So here's some radial symmetry that we see in our life and in nature, right? It's pretty common, but you know, may or may not be the best design. Remember, if you're radially symmetric, then you don't have a front or a back. Remember that? You have a front or a back only if you're bilaterally symmetric, and if you don't have a front, then you don't have a head, right? Consequently, you don't have a brain, and the other thing that bilaterally symmetric organs have is the through gut. Do you guys remember that? You know, you have the mouth and the anus and a digestive tract. Well, these guys don't. They have a one-sided gut, right? Being radially symmetric, food goes in one side, and that's it, they only have that one side, right? I mean, it's a, their stomach is a pouch, not like ours. Our stomach is kind of has like two tubes running off of it. This one is just a pouch with one opening, right? So let's, let's examine this real quick. If you have, you know, a, a jellyfish right here, right? Does anybody know where the mouth of the jellyfish is? Right here, right? You know, the bottom, to where the tentacles are. So we like to describe this jellyfish with two different sides. Okay, two different sides. The side that has a mouth and the side that does not have a mouth. Okay, the side that has a mouth is called the oral surface, and the other one is just the aboral surface. Remember, when you attach A to the front of a word, it, it cancels it out, right? It means without or no. Okay, so oral and aboral, right? We got the oral surface that has the mouth and the aboral surface that is just basically the other end. Okay, so let's just say a fish is swimming along and the fish gets caught in the tentacles. Well, the fish gets you know, taken up by the tentacles into the mouth, right? And when it's done being digested, where does it go? It just comes out the same way because that is the only way, right? So, you know, sea anemones, jellyfish, they eat, and then when they're done, the poop just comes out of their mouth, right? Because that's all they have. They have a one-sided gut, 
very primitive. They have not evolved an anus yet. <clears throat> okay, so I want to show you guys a video of a sea anemone catching food. So this is a sea anemone, as you guys can tell. And let's take a look at what type of food it's trying to catch and how it catches it. Okay, you're going to have to pay attention because just, just to... Uh, I don't know, warn you guys or whatever, the, the food is really small, okay? So let you guys know, the food is really small. That's the one I want you guys to see. Did you guys see that? Let's watch that one one more time. Alright, one more time. Swimming up. Okay. So we saw what happened, right? A little, tiny little, probably an amphipod swam up and it touched one of the tentacles by accident and then the tentacle withdrew it into its mouth. Right? Okay. So what are we eating here? Tiny little particles in, in the water. That's basically plankton, right? It's trying to catch those suspended particles in the water, okay? See, here's the thing. You don't catch suspended particles in the water when you eat. You, you pick up things from the ground or from the table or something. You just pick things up that are lying around. But this thing picks tiny things up that are floating in the water, okay? Depending on where you get your food, sometimes we name their feeding style according to where they got their food from. So in this case, since they're eating the little particles of the water, in the water, right, we call it, oops, we call it suspension feed, right? So suspension because you guys know what a suspension or a solution is, right, from chemistry. Solution is when the particle is so small it's dissolved, right? But suspension is when the particle is not dissolved, but it's just floating around in the water. Okay, so we got all these little plankton floating around in the water. And if you catch those particles and that's how you eat your food, then you're suspension feeding, right? So here, suspension feeding. Catching, eating particles from the water with or without a net, okay? Like in this case, you guys saw it was using tentacles, so it wasn't using a net, right? It didn't use a net to catch the particles. It was kind of just kind of grabbing them one by one. Now, if you do use a net, then we have another word for this. You guys know what I'm talking about? If you do use a net, it is called filter feeding, right, okay? So filter feeding is a type of suspension feeding in which you do use a net, and you pass a current of water through the net, right? <clears throat> so who else is a filter feeder? We talked about before. Here. Whales and also whale sharks? Yeah, that's correct, but that we have talked about before. Sponges, right? What were you gonna say? Oh, sponges. Oh, sponges. Okay, yeah. So sponges, they filter feed with their little coanocytes, right? They cause the water to go in through their osteo and they filter it out of their osteo, right? Okay. Um, sea anemones and stuff. They're not filter feeders, but they are suspension feeders. They are taking the same food source from the same location, but it's not a, the same style exactly. Right? Okay. So hopefully that makes. All right, that being said, the sponge is also a suspension feeder. Is that okay? Yeah? Because filter feeding is a type of suspension feeder. <clears throat> okay, so let's continue on. Um, talk about its life stages, right? So life stages. The life stage is when you're growing up from birth to death, and you may or may not change form, okay? It's in terms of invertebrates, they change form pretty often. In this case, right, we have two major forms right over here, the polyp and the medusa. Okay, so let's take a look at those, right? Over here is the life cycle of a jellyfish. We have a jellyfish eggs, and then the eggs hatch into its larva. Okay, great. We can introduce its larval type. Its larval type is called a flannula, which means oval, basically, right? So 
we've got the planula larva. That is the larval type of a jellyfish or other cnidarians, right? Every cnidarian uses the planula larva. Okay, so make sure you guys are paying attention to the larval types because we got the parent chymula from the sponge and now we have this planula of a cnidarian. Okay, every single invertebrate we go over, we'll probably talk about a different larval type. Okay, so what does the planula do? It swims around. Right. It swims around looking for a nice place to settle, settle onto the ground. Okay. And once it finds a nice place, then it'll settle. Like it'll choose a spot, it'll go there and turn into the next life stage. Right? When you change life stages, it's called metamorphosis, right? And when you choose a place to land, it's called larval settlement. So let's just imagine if the planula chooses a place to land, it does larval settlement and turns into a polyp. Right? So a polyp is defined as the life stage in which the aboral surface is attached to the ground, right? It's attached to the substrate, and the oral surface is up in the water with its tentacles up in the water, right? That's what a polyp is. Okay, so how can you tell if it's a polyp? Well, is its aboral surface attached to the ground? Are there tentacles up in the water? It's a polyp, right? And then for some reason, the polyp eventually comes up off of the ground flips over and turns into an adult jellyfish, which we call a medusa, right? You guys know who medusa is? Yeah, medusa? The, the, one with the, the demon from the Greek mythology. Yeah. Yeah, well, what about her? Yeah, she's got snakes for hair, right? So, uh, I mean, it kind of looks like <laughs> medusa, right? So, um, the, je the adult jellyfish, right, is called the medusa stage. And you see how it has flipped over now, right? Now, its aboral surface is on the top and its oral surface is on the bottom, right? And then it starts over, right? It has an egg and then we hatch into the final larvae. Okay, so does this make sense? We know the difference between polyp and medusa now. Medusa floats around with its aboral surface detached and on top, usually, right? And then the polyp is, does not swim around. It actually is stuck to the ground the able surface is the one that's stuck to the ground with its oral surface on the top. Okay, so that's polyp and medusa. Maybe you guys have recognized that the polyp kind of resembles, right, with it's stuck to the ground with the tentacles in the water, kind of resembles a, sorry, a sea anemone, right? So let's take a look at the sea anemone life cycle and see what they say, right? The sea anemone. Has egg, egg hatches into planula larva, as we expect. Planula larva does larval settlement and turns into a polyp. And look, it's a polyp the whole time, right? It does not ever come off the ground, flip over, and become a medusa, right? The sea anemone is a polyp throughout its entire life stage. Okay, so not all cnidarians have a medusa stage, right? That's basically jellyfish. Other ones, they stay in their polyps. Any questions on this so far? Y'all doing okay? All right, let's move on. Okay, so we got the larval type and two different life stages. Okay, so make sure we got all those down. The jellyfish actually flips over, the sea anemone does not. Okay, and the last thing is they all do not have a brain, right? What was the reason why they don't have a brain? I explained it about 10 minutes ago. They don't have a front and a back, right? Because they're not bilaterally symmetric. Okay, good. Okay, continue on. Now let's get into the different classes, right? We talked about classes of, you know, peripheral, and now we're gonna talk about classes of Nidaria. We're not gonna go over every class of every phylum, but we're gonna go over most of the relevant ones. So in this case, I have four to show you guys, right? The first one is regular jellyfish, right? Regular jellyfish is called class Cyphozoa. Okay, Cyphozoa, right there. And you guys see, these are all normal jellyfish, right? 
this one's interesting, right? This one is called an upside down jellyfish, right? What's the difference between this one and all the other ones? Well, it's oral surfaces on the top, actually, right? But it doesn't matter because it's still a medusa. Why? Because the abral surface is not stuck to the ground, right? So it's not a polyp, right? The polyp was stuck to the ground and it just like came off the ground, just didn't flip over. <clears throat> okay, so class Cyphozoa is regular jellyfish. Okay, continuing on. Sea anemones, right? Look, we got all these sea anemones. Maybe you guys have even seen this sea anemone, right, from the beach. Um, that's a giant green anemone from our tide pools. Well, this is class Anthozoa. Antho for flower, right? Antho looks like, well, they, they look like flowers, so kind of. But these are animals, right? So anthozoa, class anthozoa, and these guys, if you guys can notice, what life stage are they all in again? Oh. All in the polyp stage, right? Because they're stuck to the, the able surface. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who has actually gone to the beach and seen the scene? Couple of you guys, have you guys touched the sea anemone? Okay, so if you guys haven't touched the sea anemone, I think that the next time you guys see one, you should try it. But um, I got a quick video clip of someone touching a sea anemone. Okay, it's kind of cringy, but um, oh, it's deleted. <laughs> okay, let's see. Let's see if we can find another one though. Okay, might as well. All right, touching. Let's try this one. I got my new underwater camera. And I want just out of curiosity to see what it might be like to be a clownfish in an anemone. You know, I don't think this one's going to react. I just feel like. This one looks good. All right, that's better. Okay, so do you guys see what's happening? The tentacles that touch our finger withdraw. Oh, it's a guy. Okay, so the tentacles, um, when they touch something, they withdraw, right? They're trying to eat them, um, or it's trying to protect its tentacles by withdrawing them. It doesn't really, he doesn't really tell you how they feel, but they're supposed to feel sticky, right? Have you guys, okay, who have, have tried it? Feel, feel kind of sticky, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, why is it sticky? Because, well, here's the question. Did it hurt when it touches these people? Did he scream or anything? No. Mm -hmm. So did it sting him, right? Did it sting him? Maybe, maybe not, right? Sort of. Uh, okay, the answer is yes, because the nematocysts were fired and went into your finger, and when it, you t pull it off, it's the nematocysts getting stuck in your finger that cause it to feel sticky, right? But here's the thing, remember earlier when we were talking about how it depends on how long the nematocysts are, right, and the harpoon. If it's not long enough, then it won't touch your nerve and then you won't feel the sting, right? So if your epidermis is thicker than the length of a needle, then mm -hmm. it won't hurt you. Does that make sense? And that's the case with sea anemones, right? Sea anemones, they do sting, but it's just that they can't sting you to any effect, right? Because it gets stuck in their skin. Okay? So when you touch one and it feels sticky, that's you getting stung. And so how would you like to feel the actual pain from a you know, sea anemone sting, right? Well, if it's a question of Thin, or sorry, skin thickness, then you just need to use a thin part of your skin, like your tongue, for example. So if you want to try, you can go lick the, the sea anemone, and then maybe you'll feel something. So I've never done that before, but um, I, I asked someone who has, and he said that it tastes spicy. Which, I mean, it makes a lot of sense, right? Because uh, spicy food it is a type of sharp burning pain. 
Okay, cool. So CNM is a juice thing. We, they're just too short. We, okay, continuing on. What are these organisms right over here? Coral. Yeah, they are coral. Does anybody know the names of some of these corals? Yeah, this one's a brain coral, right? Okay, so corals, right? Why are we talking about corals? Coral is a rocky structure, right? If you touch it, it literally is completely hard, right? So what does it have to do with this group? Well, if you want to like look microscopic, right? Just get take a microscope, look microscopic into the coral, you will find these tiny little things. What are these? What are these? How how could you describe these structures right here? These are polyps, right? Look, the abral surface is attached to the ground, and the tentacles are up in the water, right? These look like mini sea anemones, maybe, right? Okay, so because it has polyps like this, then scientists have decided to put the corals in with the sea anemones into class Anthozoa, right? So class Anthozoa is not just sea anemones, it also has corals in it. The difference between sea anemones and corals, though, is that sea anemones, they're just usually solitary. Sometimes they do have a couple of small pods growing off of them, like a little colony, but these guys are like, a whole colony of microscopic polyps, and they build the skeleton underneath. That's what makes them hard, right? So the coral polyps, they all band together, the millions of millions of little tiny microscopic, right, you guys look at that picture. Millions of microscopic polyps all coming together to make this shell, make this shell underneath. What do you think that shell is made out of? Calcium carbonate, like everything else, right? Okay, so it's made out of calcium carbonate, and like we mentioned before, if you build a calcareous shell or a big calcareous structure, what could you do? You can build a you can build a reef, right? If you get enough of them, right? And there we go, we get a coral reef. Coral reefs are built up of all the skeletons of the coral, right? We'll talk more about coral reefs in the last lecture, but the point is when they come together and build a reef, they can sometimes, if you have enough of them, even build complete like islands and oceanographic features, such as atolls. Right? Atolls are made of coral. Does anybody know what an atoll is? Does anybody know what an atoll looks like? Here's an atoll. That one over in South Pacific and this one over here in Hawaii, right? Okay. Look, what is it? It's a ring-shaped island. Okay, that's what an atoll is, and this ring-shaped island is made out of coral. Okay, um, let's talk about it. This ring right around here, surrounding this lagoon, this really deep lagoon in the center, and the ocean on the side. Right, this ring part is made out of coral. How does that come to be? Well, let's take a look at this diagram right here. All these little islands start off as volcanoes coming up from the ground, and you know, all this stuff, this is igneous rock, right? This volcanic stuff comes up and hardens and turns into island. Well, do you see on the edges? You start growing a coral reef right here, okay? The edges, here's the thing, I'm not gonna tell you why yet, but corals need to live in shallow water, all right? Corals need to live in shallow water, and they only, they like to live in shallow water, so they always try to. These corals, they form what's called a fringing reef. Fringe means edge, right? The edge of the island is covered in these coral reefs, okay? So right now, the main islands of Hawaii have fringing reef around them, okay? Over time, this island begins to sink, all right? I'm not gonna tell you why, unless you're really curious. All right, we can talk about that after class. But um, the island begins to sink over a really, really long time, and when it does, you see like this part of the coral growing around it goes into deeper water. Those corals are not gonna make it, right? They need to live in shallow water. So what do they do? New coral grows on top of the old coral to maintain that depth, okay? While the island sinks. So eventually the island will completely sink like this and it takes the coral down with it. These corals die, these ones. But in order to stay alive, the new corals keep growing up and up. And since you know they already started growing at these highest points, they just keep growing up at the highest points and they end up creating a ring. Okay? So they just keep growing up and up on top of each other to maintain the same depth. 
right? Because the corals need the shallow water, right? And then eventually you get an atoll, right? A ring shape. Okay, so yeah, again, we'll revisit coral reefs and why they need shallow water in the very last lecture, but this is just a little tidbit of corals. Okay, so corals, they build a calcareous skeleton and they are in class Anthozoa. You guys can read that at home. All right, continuing on, next group, hydroids, right? This one, um, I mean, this is kind of like a throwaway group, right? If it's not a sea anemone, if it's not a jellyfish, then it's a hydroid, usually. I mean, that's kind of how most people go about it. And as you guys can see, not all of these are stuck to the ground, and not all of them are floating around. Okay, see, these two, are, these are floating around, but these ones are stuck to the ground. So those are kind of like the polyp style hydroids, and these are like the medusa style hydroids. But uh, hydroid is just a common name for class Hydrozoa. It's not super creative. It's, uh, you know, it's just it's just a group that I want you guys to know the name of. That's all. Okay. The only reason why I want you guys to know the name of this group is does anybody recognize this one? It's a really famous bacteria. Right? What is it called? The men box um, jellyfish? Uh, this is not a box jellyfish. Portuguese man of war? Yeah, it's called the Portuguese man of war. And it's pretty uh, toxic, right? It's, um, it's really dangerous. But it's not jellyfish, okay? See, that's, that's why I wanted to mention it, right? Everybody thinks it's a jellyfish, but it's not. It's actually a hydroid, okay? So that's the only reason why I want you to know this group, okay? Portuguese man of war is not a jellyfish. It's a hydroid, class hydroid. <clears throat> okay, so let's continue on. Last group, box jellyfish. Now, box jellyfish is something for you guys to be worried about if you're in Australia or something, right? But they're pretty toxic, right? They're the most venomous animal in the world, right? They are a class Cubozoa. I personally think that's the easiest class to remember, right? Because box cube, okay? So, hydroids, hydrozoa, box jellyfish, Cubozoa. Okay, that one's easy, right? Cubozoa, most venomous animals, right? Uh, there's a bunch of venomous animals out there, but the most one is the box jellyfish, right? It happens to live in Australia, where all the other venomous animals live, right? I don't know why, but literally, the most venomous everything lives in Australia, right? It's pretty crazy, right? They have the most venomous animal, the box jellyfish, most venomous fish, stonefish, right? Most venomous mollusk is a blue ringed octopus and the most dangerous spider Sydney funnel web spider and one of the most dangerous snakes inland taipan they all live in Australia right um, not sure why yeah Joe Brian? so does the, the box jellyfish live in Australia because of the hot water like the hot temperature like the warm water I'm not sure if box jellyfish are partial to warm water but uh, other regions that do have warm water also have box jellyfish so maybe they are yeah, but I don't know much enough about box jellyfish to say why they only live in warm water. I don't see why they couldn't live in regular water. Right. <clears throat> if I were to guess, maybe warm water fish swim faster than cold water fish. Right. I mean, I'm not completely sure, but usually the reason why something wants to be toxic is it wants to kill its prey as fast as possible. And a jellyfish that doesn't have a brain and doesn't know where it's going can't chase after its prey. So. It has to make sure it catches it, and if it doesn't kill the fish fast enough, then the fish will swim away, right? And it might still die in this little spare. But um, if you have toxic enough venom, then you could probably kill it fast enough. So, you know, if you're in an area with fast swimming fish, then that would be useful, right? But I'm, I'm not sure if the tropics has faster swimming fish in cold water. Um, but it's possible, I mean, I can see why that's the case. Like, warmer water usually has faster metabolisms and cause them to swim faster, but I don't know. Right. Good question. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, anyways, venomous animal in the world can kill you in a few minutes because it stops your breathing and it actually kills people. Okay, like, whenever Australia has these in bloom, right, we have to have those nets uh, to prevent swimmers from getting. Uh, attacked by these guys, or I mean not attacked, but like touched by them. Right. And the, the sad thing is, 
they're radially symmetric, super simple, and they don't have a brain, right? Yet they are so toxic. <clears throat> okay. Does anybody know what um, lifeguards carry around to try to remedy people who got stung? Vinegar, right? Usually some sort of acid, right? Because the toxins are protein based, and then acids can usually neutralize. <clears throat> okay, so any questions on this? I think we're finished with all the ideas. Okay, so we covered, you know, all the different body parts, the life cycle, different uh, attributes, the meaning of Iberian, the larval type, and their feeding style, and four different classes. Okay, so we should be paying attention to all those different things as we go through all these different parts. Right. Okay, so just one question. Did you guys notice anything similar between the names of all the Nidarian classes? No. They all end in Zoa. Good, okay. That's what I want you guys to pay attention to. Most of the classes of the same phylum have some sort of suffix in in common, okay? So that'll at least help you a little bit, right? All the ones in Nigeria and in Zoa. Okay, Zoa means animal, but this doesn't really matter. The point is, it, you can use it as a way to try to memorize all of the different classes. Okay, so I know the classes get a little bit confusing. We haven't talked about that many yet, but remember, as long as you're keeping up at every step of the way, then every time I introduce new classes, you only have to focus on those new ones because you already got the old ones. You don't have to refresh yourself on the old ones because you already know them, all right? So make sure you guys are keeping up. We got the three sponge classes. Now we got four Nidarian classes. And when we talk about mollusks next, it's, it's just gonna, we're just gonna add more and more. So make sure you guys are really keeping on top of this stuff, okay? A lot of people get confused between class and phylum. Okay, so make sure we are paying attention to that. Just like on the quiz, when I ask about domain and I snuck a kingdom in. Okay, any questions so far? Are you doing okay?